us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. You may be seated. Children, eat it. Good morning, church. And I'm telling you, I, oh, by the way, great job this morning, music team. You know, I, I was, I got to tell you guys this, I was sitting here thinking, I've been doing this for a little while, and one of the things that I often do to try to measure the, try to measure where we are as uh, church staff and leadership and how in sync we are with what's going on in our own lives, and we don't, I don't sit down with Sean some pastors do this, I don't, sit down with Sean and say, hey, uh, here's what I'm preaching on this week, pick some good songs for that topic. We, we never have that discussion. But I've noticed the last several weeks, uh, he continues to uh, put a set together that's absolutely right, right in line with what we're talking about. Um, the, the second song he did this morning was, <laughs> those of you that are in the Romans Bible study know that was exactly what we were talking about in there this morning. And... Uh, and it just so happens that this whole business of God's glory, I'm going to be talking about that in the sermon this, af- this, this afternoon. Yeah, that's how long it's going to take. Uh-oh. <laughs> uh, hey, you know, I'm not kidding when I tell you guys, when I come up here on Sunday morning, I, what I want to do is just kind of stand here and look at you for a while. And, and, and I think I'm right about this. You guys are better looking this week than you were last week. Amen. Yeah. Uh, in fact, turn to the person next to you and say, you're better looking than you were last week. <laughs> okay, stop. That went longer than I thought. You guys like hearing that, don't you? Yeah, well, I do look good today. All right. Okay, well, if you uh, have been with us for the past couple of weeks, then you know we have started this uh, new sermon series simply called Disciple. And uh, we talk a lot around here about this idea of discipleship, and we often encourage all of you to engage in the disciple-making process. And uh, I've said before that I and the other elders have had several of you come to us and say, what does that even mean? Uh, What does it mean to be a disciple and to engage in this disciple-making process? And I will tell you that since I started this series, I've had a few of you express your appreciation for the subject matter of this series because... You have never been clear on what we're talking about when we use those terms and phrases. And so I'm hoping that this is helping you. I'm hoping by the time we get done with this, which I don't know when that's going to be, Jesus might come back first, uh, you'll have a better understanding of what discipleship is, what that looks like, what it means to engage in that, in that process if there is such a thing. Um, when I began so a few weeks ago, I said that the goal here is to define what discipleship is and what it means to disciple someone else. And I would add, if discipling someone else is even possible, technically speaking, we'll get into that. I said we were going to look into how we can engage in the disciple-making process and what that might look like. And I also said we would look into who we are being called to be a disciple to, which, of course, is the Lord Jesus Christ. And that, in fact, is the subject matter of this morning's uh, message. The message title this morning is actually a question, and I want us to consider this question this morning. I want each of you to please do this, and the question is just this, who is this Jesus? Now, if you've been with us so far, you know that we have spent some time looking at the cost of discipleship. We've talked about the importance of counting the cost involved in being an apprentice to Jesus Christ, and we have considered some questions that might help us determine if we are indeed disciples or not. But I think before we go much further into this issue of discipleship, it might be a good idea to talk about just who it is that we are being called to follow. Just who is this Jesus that we're being called to be disciples of? Now, I reckon we should be clear about who it is that we're committing to being apprentices of. Amen? And I know some of you are sitting there right now thinking, we know that. We know. We know the answer to that, Hutch. You don't need it. Well... We're just going to dive into it anyway, because I think it helps us to be reminded. In fact, uh, near the end of his ministry, and 
and the time he spent with his 12 of his closest followers, Jesus himself posed this very question to them. Who do you say that I am? And so we're going to look at that passage in a minute, but before we do, let me just tell you why I think this is something that we need to do. We just need to do this. I've seen, uh, I've seen in, in the years that I've been doing this, I've seen a lot of things where people are just, I mean, I, here's what I believe. I believe that there are people sitting in churches all across America this morning who are sitting in the churches and they are serving not the Jesus of the Bible, but the Jesus of their own making. They are following the Jesus that they want to follow, not the Jesus who is. To put it another way, I think far too often the Jesus we worship is merely a reflection of ourselves. And by the way, there's not a person in this room who's immune from this way of looking at Jesus. It happens to us all from time to time. Jesus would be much easier to follow if he were just like me. I know you guys probably don't agree with that. but And by the way, uh, when we refuse to regularly open the scriptures and let them reveal to us the real Jesus, when we fail to do that, we will inevitably make Jesus in our own image. That's what we'll do. In a sense, we domesticate Jesus. We tame him. We make for ourselves a Jesus that fits into our own agendas and a Jesus that does our bidding. Now let me just say this as clearly as I can. I'm fixing to get wound up here, so hang on. Any Jesus that is not both Savior and Lord, any Jesus that is not sac- the sacrificial Lamb of God, any Jesus that is not the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, any Jesus that you have replaced on the throne is not the Jesus of the Gospels. And any Jesus that does not call you to a radical, sacrificial, and yes, even sometimes a painful discipleship cannot be the real Jesus. I fear that one of the mistakes we make when we read the scriptures is we read them to try to find ourselves in there rather than to try to find Jesus in there. Well, the gospels have a lot to say about us, to be sure, but they are not about us. They are about Christ. And the smartest thing that you and I can do before we even consider becoming his apprentice is to read the scriptures, listen to them, master them, or better yet, be mastered by them and by the Christ that they describe. Now, before we go any further, I want to convey something else to you in the strongest of terms that I could come up with. The question posed in this passage we're about to read, the question posed in the title of the message this morning, who is this Jesus? More specifically, I want to make it more personal, who is Jesus to you? And let me say this, this is the most important question that could ever be asked. There are a lot of questions surrounding this life that you and I will ask in the course of our, of our lives. A lot of important questions that we should ask because the answers to those questions will determine so much about how we decide to live our lives. And the lack of clarity over some of these important questions can cost us so much. But beloved, there is no question that is more significant than the one we posed this morning concerning Jesus. One of the reasons this question is in a class all of its own is because of its universal relevance to every man and woman of every culture and every people group and every societal class on the face of this planet. This question cannot be ignored by anyone. In fact, to ignore it is to to answer it. If you choose to ignore it or be nonchalant about it because it just doesn't seem relevant to you, then even that willful ignorance has great consequences in your life. So it is a question that is binding on all humanity. Is it a question that every single person in this room drawing breath will be accountable to? And so this question has a universal, cross-generational, cross-cultural application. And whether you're interested to answer it or not, it does apply to you. Because here's the thing. Listen carefully. How you and I respond to this question even if it is with absolute indifference, 
will frame the trajectory of the rest of our life to come. And it will certainly determine whether or not and how you will go about being his disciple. Not only that, but your answer to this question will determine your life eternally. So we must understand this as a question of most importance. Have I, have I conveyed that? <laughs> we are not dealing with some kind of lighthearted thing that we can debate about. This is something that demands a personal verdict from every single one of us. So that's what I want to do this morning, is to look carefully and seriously at just who is this Jesus. If you turn with me in your Bible to Mark chapter 8, the 8th chapter in the book of Mark, I'll wait for you to get there so you can see this passage with your own eyes. I like to hear pages turn. I wish you guys would all bring Bibles instead of phones so I could hear more pages turn. It doesn't matter. Whatever you have, get there. It's good. So this scene we're about to read comes toward the end of Jesus' earthly ministry. It's about, it happens about six months before he goes to the cross. And it's a significant time because it is here that Jesus reveals his plans for the church. And he makes a pretty definitive statement about who he claims to be. So let's read together. Mark chapter 8, verse 27. And Jesus went on with his disciples to the village of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples... Who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others one of the prophets. And he asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, well, you are the Christ. And he strictly charged him to tell no one about him. This is the most important question we each need to answer. Who is Jesus Christ to you? How would you answer that question if you were asked? What comes to your mind? What jumps in your heart when you hear that question? Does the question bring you peace? Does it cause confusion? Is there certainty when you think about that question? Who is this Jesus? How you answer that question will ultimately affect so many things. It will affect your identity, who you are, and what you will experience, not just in this life, but in the eternal. It's a big question. And I guess that's why it strikes me uh, in this passage, when Jesus chooses, when he chooses to ask it, it's kind of an odd time for, from my perspective. I mean, look at again at verse 27. Jesus and his disciples are making their way to a place called Caesarea Philippi, but they're not there yet. They're still walking down the road. And... Uh, and one would think that such an important question as this would be reserved for maybe in the classroom or maybe when they're sitting around the table some evening where there's not so much going on, they could just really focus on it. But, but that's not what happens here. These guys are just walking down the road. I imagine there's some chit-chat going on, perhaps talking about their destination and whether any of them had, had been there before. Maybe they were discussing the blind guy that Jesus had just healed in Bethsaida, how it had taken Jesus two tries to fully restore the man's eyesight. Have you ever noticed that? In fact, let me, let me just chase a little rabbit here. Back up to Mark 8, uh, 22. This happened right before. They came to Bethsaida, and some people brought to him a blind man and begged him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. And when he had spit in his eyes and laid his hands on him, he asked, Do you see anything? And he looked up and said, I, I see people, but they look like trees walking. Then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again, and he opened his eyes. His sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. What happened there? Did Jesus not use enough spit the first time? I don't think that was it. I'll tell you what I do think. I think Jesus was taking another opportunity to teach his disciples something. I believe this is a picture of the present and future kingdom. Jesus was all about the kingdom. He announced that with him the kingdom had come, but not yet fully come. And we see the kingdom of God today like the blind guy in this account. Things are blurry, not quite clear. People look like trees. But one day, one day, Scripture teaches that we will see him clearly and we will know him fully. In the meantime, we must decide who Jesus is to us in the here and now, and live accordingly. Decide if we will fully follow.
follow him or not. So back to my earlier point, as we're traveling, as they're traveling down the road, Jesus is teaching him, and this was his way of teaching his disciples. We'll, we'll talk more about that in weeks to come, but he shows them a picture of the already here, not fully here kingdom in the healing of this blind man. Not in the classroom, but as they are going along. And we see Jesus teach this way often. And then here in verse 27, as they're still on their way, Jesus begins to lead up to the most important question he would ever ask his disciples. Hey, fellas, by the way, who do people say I am? Now, Jesus did not ask this question because he was feeling insecure or worried about whether people liked him as much today as they did yesterday. He's not concerned about the latest polls. This question is, however, very intentional because it is leading up to the more important question. So the disciples reply, "Uh, well, Jesus, some say you're John the Baptist. Other people think you're Elijah. Some people think you're one of the prophets. So again, Jesus setting the stage for the most important question. In fact, I don't believe Jesus really cared to know what others thought about him at this point, but he was about to make this point to his disciples, and I think it's a good point for us to consider this morning. It really does not matter what other people think about Jesus. I'll say that again. It really does not matter what other people think about Jesus. We cannot move in kingdom ways based on what someone else thinks about Jesus. We cannot be proper disciples of Jesus until we first form our own opinion and belief about who he is. And so here it comes. Jesus. Oh yeah, so that's what they think. Well, let me ask you boys another question. Here comes the zinger. Here comes the most important question he ever asked them, and he gets real personal. Who do you say that I am? What other people think of me is one thing, but what really matters is who do you guys think I am? The question at hand for the disciples and for us is, will we allow the popular and prevalent ideas about Jesus shape what and who I believe Jesus Christ is? In other words, before you can even begin to answer the question, who is Jesus Christ, you first have to identify the source of your answer. Is what you believe about the person of Jesus Christ simply a collection of sound bites that you've heard from others? Or are you basing your answer on the truth of God's word and Jesus' own claims about himself? Because that matters a great deal. When I hear a Christian say something like, well, to me, Jesus is, I get a little nervous. Because that statement can go one of two ways. And unless you complete that statement with what the Bible says about Jesus, then you're already wrong. But if you are confident that your understanding of who Jesus is has been established from the one place that it should be established, the only place that it should be, that is the Word of God and Jesus' own claims, then you're on the right track. But understand, if you follow the Jesus of the Bible and not the Jesus of your own making, then be prepared to follow and believe the Jesus that most of the world disagrees with. More than that, the Jesus that much of the world hates. And so Jesus here makes that point. He first asks, what is the world saying about him? And then he asks, what do you say about me? Implying what? That the answer to those questions is probably not going to be the same. And so there are implications here that we cannot miss. Jesus is asking, is what you believe about me shaped by what the world believes about me? If not then you're prepared to believe the truth about who I am, even though the rest of the world will not agree with you. We hate people disagreeing with us, don't we? We want to be right. We always want to be right. But if we follow the Jesus of the Bible, we're going to have a lot of people disagree with us. Peter, he jumps up and answers, you're the Christ. And that's the right answer. And when you read this account of Matthew in chapter 16, you see Jesus praises Peter for this answer. And he says to him, he goes on to tell him, I'm going to build my church on that truth and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Peter, good answer. So why am I belaboring this so much? I've been going on a while about this now, haven't I? 
Yep. <laughs> What's really at stake here, folks? One of my favorite authors, A.W. Tozer, says, what comes into our mind when we think about God is the most important thing about you. Did you hear that? What comes into your mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you. Not your salary, not your health, not your looks. The most important thing about you, beloved, is what comes to your mind when you think about God. And it's, it, is it based on Scripture, or is it based on the latest worldly ideas about God and Jesus? Now, there's two important reasons to get the answer right when asked, who is this Jesus? The first one is pretty obvious. How you answer that question will ultimately determine one's eternal destiny. One time, Jesus is in a bit of a back and forth with, with the Pharisees, something that happened quite often, the so-called religious leaders of his day. I want to pick up this exchange in John chapter 8. If you have your Bible, you can turn to John 8. Let's start reading in verse 18. John 8, 18. It says, Jesus says to the Pharisees, I am the one who bears witness about myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness about me. They said to him, therefore, where is your Father? Jesus answered, you know neither me nor my Father. If you knew me, you would know my Father also. These words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, but no one arrested him because his hour had not yet come. And so he said to them again, I'm, I'm going away, and you will seek me, and you will die in your sin. Where I am going, you cannot come. So Jesus said, or so the Jews said, will, will he kill himself? Since he says, where I am going, you cannot come. The arrogance of these guys sometimes. Verse 23, he said to them, you are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Now this is interesting because that last line, verse 24, the word he, I am he, the word he is not included in the Greek. It simply translates I am. And so verse 24 would read like this, I told you that you would die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. Now to the Hebrew ears of these Pharisees, this was an absolute claim to deity. Jesus was actually ascribing himself to himself the name and the identity that exclusively belonged to the God of Israel, I am. And Jesus could not be more clear about the necessity of believing he is God incarnate or run the risk of dying in our sins, unforgiven and eternally separated from him. In order to die free from my sins is contingent upon my belief in the right Jesus. Now that should compel you to get to know the Jesus of the Bible. And it should compel you to ignore the Jesus of your own making or the Jesus of Islam, or the Jesus of Jehovah's Witness, or the Jesus of the Mormons. Wrong Jesus. This is the condition that Christ himself sets. You must believe that I am. If you reject this, then you do not have eternal life. Jesus is not saying that you have to explain theology and doctrine to a certain level if you're going to be accepted. That's not what he's saying here. What he is saying to you is that you have to wholeheartedly embrace what has been made known to you in the one place that you can really know him. The scriptures tell us all we need to know about Jesus in order to attain eternal salvation. But to what extent? What do you and I need to believe about Jesus in order for me and you to be saved? What do we have to believe? Pay attention. What is it about his attributes? What is it about his person? What is it about his work that I must believe to be saved? We say, believe in Jesus, but what? What is required of me in that regard? Well, there's one verse in Scripture that I believe adequately explains what you have to believe about Jesus to be saved. You all know it, probably, Romans 10, 9. 
Romans 10, 9 simply says, Paul writes, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You will be saved. Paul defines two categories about Christ that must be acknowledged in order for one to be assured of salvation. Please know these, and I hope you believe this. The first deals with the nature of Jesus. First, confess that Jesus is something. (laughs) He is someone. He occupies a certain position. It says Jesus is Lord. We like him as Savior, but Paul Paul doesn't say confess him as Savior here. Isn't that interesting? What does he say? He says confess him as Lord. That is his nature. The second thing that we see here is his mission, which is inferred by this, that God raised him from the the dead. He defeated sin and death. That's what he came here to do. That was his mission, and he accomplished both when he was nailed to the cross and when he was raised from the dead. My sin was crucified. Your sin was crucified with him, and we have new life in his resurrection. And I can expect and have hope in a future resurrection just like his. Amen? Yes, amen? That's all I need to believe about Jesus to be saved. This is what John wrote in chapter 20 of his gospel. He said, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Now, of course, We can have all kinds of other discussions. For example, if you say, I believe that Jesus is Lord, but I'm not sure about the whole Trinity thing, you might say that. Well, then we need to have more conversations. My point is, there's a whole lot more to Scripture than these couple of verses that we just looked at. But as far as salvation, what kind of confession is Jesus really looking for from us? Well, if you drop down to verse 34 in our text in Mark chapter 8, Same context, he's still in the same context. Look what Jesus says. Mark 8, 34, he says, and calling the crowd, it says, and calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? So what I want you to see here is that Jesus is explaining the kind of confession from us that he's looking for. It is a confession of truth. That's that's true. But it is also, if you notice, it is also a confession of surrender. We don't like that word surrender. It sounds like defeat to us, but not in Jesus' economy. Surrender in Jesus' economy is victory. Yes, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, but further than that, he is your Lord, right? It's the same principle Jesus was driving at with the two questions up in verse 27. Who do the people say I am? Okay, who do you say I am? Same thing here. It's one thing to say Jesus is Lord to everybody. That's easy to say. But is he your Lord? Is he the one that you follow? So determining who Jesus Christ is will determine your eternal fate. But also, to answer that question, will not only determine the life to come, it will determine the depth of your transformation in this life. So once you ask the question and receive the foundational knowledge, then you embrace it of who Jesus Christ is, you have to also learn there's a deeper understanding of Christ that still awaits you. There's so much more. And the deeper understanding of Jesus Christ that awaits you is dependent upon your answering that question again and again and again. To ask the question, who is this Jesus, and to answer it rightly is wonderful. But we cannot stop asking it. Once you believe it, you need to keep asking it. And this is where the discipleship part comes in. This is what makes you a disciple. 
that once you confess who the real Jesus is, your quest for the rest of your life is discovering more and more and more of the person of Jesus Christ. Who is he? When Paul encountered Christ on the road to Damascus, he asked this question, Who are you, Lord? Now, you can ask that question at the beginning of your walk with Christ, but you will continue to ask that if you're really born again and you truly want to be his disciple. Why? Why would you keep asking that question? Because the Apostle Paul, who said at the beginning, facing Christ, who are you? That was the same Paul in Philippians 3 who said, oh, oh, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. So Paul didn't stop asking the question. When he met Christ, the real Christ, the true Christ, the Messiah, he lived the rest of his life to discover more of him, to truly become his disciple. And so this question that Jesus asked, but who do you say that I am? Yes, it's the entry point, but it should also be the essence of your Christian existence from that point forward. I thank you, Lord, that I know your nature. I know your work. I know what you've done to save me. But Lord, who are you? I want to know more. I want to discover more. I want to joyfully investigate your, here it is, Sean sang a song about a while ago, your glory. And that hunger for him and that discipline to find out more about him as as you pour over the scriptures is the primary means of your supernatural and spiritual transformation as an individual. Let me prove it to you. You may be familiar with this passage. 2 Corinthians 3.18. It says, And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. This verse is talking about our sanctification, our spiritual transformation. Beholding the glory of the Lord is not a one-time thing. It's a continual act. It's actually, that is actually the tense of the verb used here. It's an ongoing continual act. And being transformed from one degree of glory to another is also a continuous consequence, not a one-time reality. And notice what Paul is saying here. He's saying that when you behold the glory of the Lord, there is a reward as a result of you choosing to fix yourself on who He is. And what that tells me is that Christian transformation is not by you behaving. It's by you first beholding big difference people think the opposite people believe if i if i want to strive for more christ likeness i must behave true but if you want to really really behave you're first going to need to behold the art of beholding the glory of god is virtually lost in our culture And yet Paul says here that it is the instrument, it is the force that remodels you and renews you from the inside out. So if you fail to behold his glory, you will not become what he wants you to become. No wonder you're exhausted. No wonder you're discouraged. You've made your Christian life all about behaving. Just do this, don't do that. And when you don't do the thing that you're supposed to do or you do the things that you're not supposed to do, just try again. Keep trying. And you're exhausted. No wonder you're miserable. Why? Because you didn't realize that what the Holy Spirit's inviting you to do is to behold Him. Before anything else, behold Him. What are we beholding? What aspect of the glory of God The aspect of the glory of God is so hard to describe for us. What aspect of his heavenly glory, his divine glory, his creative glory, what about this glory? Well, Paul actually gives the answer. If you go to 2 Corinthians, not 3, but chapter 4, look at verse 6. This is the glory that Paul has in mind for you and I to behold, to put before our eyes of our heart and to absorb with the affection and our attention. 2 Corinthians 4, 6, For God who said, Let light shine out of the darkness, 
has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. What am I pointing my eyes to? What aspect of God's glory? The face of Jesus. The exact imprint of His nature, the perfect reflection of the glory of the Father is found in the face of the Son. And what Paul wants you to behold day in and day out is the face of the Savior. And as you behold that face, as you admire that face, as you study that face, something in your heart is truly transformed and it will begin to yearn for that face to be mirrored on your own face. And we're told in Corinthians 3.18 that this comes by the Spirit. When God sees you and I beholding Jesus, He will honor that pursuit and He will imprint on you the image of Christ. It is a supernatural occurrence over time as you set your eyes and your heart on Him. How do we do that practically, though? I mean, we will strive to be with Jesus. You say, man, Hutch, that's hard because He's not physically here. How can I be with Him? Two ways. Read the scriptures that speak of Him. And if you have one of those Bibles that has the red letters in it, you know, the ones that are Him speaking, you know, the places where He is speaking, read those. And second thing you can do is talk to Him. Ask Him, Lord, show me your glory. Show me how you think and how you act in the world around you as I read this word. Try this. Read the book of Matthew. And as you read, ask the Lord to show you His glory. Have you ever asked that before you read the book of Matthew? Lord, I'm going to read this. Show me your glory. Show me your beauty. Show me your majesty, your splendor, His holiness, all of that stuff. But try to behold Him instead of looking for doctrinal and practical wisdom. Those are good things, but that is a different kind of Bible study. Set that aside and just look for Him. If you're not looking for the face of Jesus Christ, you will not be transformed the way He wants you to be transformed. We're going to talk more about being with Jesus in the coming weeks, but for now, let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Turn to Matthew chapter 17. Matthew 17 and verse 24. I still got about 45 minutes. We're good. You guys are going, please, please, no. Okay, Matthew 17, 24. When they came to Capernaum, the collectors of the two drachma tax went up to Peter and said, does your teacher not pay tax? He said, yes. And when he came to the house, Jesus spoke to him first saying, what do you think, Simon? From whom do kings of the earth take toll or tax? From their sons or from others? And when he said from others, Jesus said to him, then the sons are free. What in the world? Let's just stop here for a second and understand what's going on. The Jews are asking Peter, hey, your rabbi here, does he pay the temple tax? Does he pay the tax that funds and supports the activity and the substance of the place of worship? Peter says, yeah, he does. I hope. And he goes back to find Jesus to make sure that that's understood. Now, Jesus Being omniscient doesn't have to wait for Peter to ask. He knows exactly what that conversation went like and what Peter was thinking and what he was about to ask. And he says, hey, Peter, let me ask you something. When the kings of the earth, when they take toll or tax, do they take it from their own sons or from others? Peter answers rightly. He says, from others. Then Jesus says, sons are free. And what Jesus is getting at here is I'm not required to give the temple tax because it's my father's temple. In fact, the temple points to me. In fact, I'm greater than the temple, so I'm not required to give this tax. The temple is actually all for me. So being the son, I'm free. Just like the world today, a king wouldn't tax his family. He would tax the citizens of the land. I'm exempt from this, Peter. He establishes that truth. Now, here's where you get a glimpse of the glory of of Jesus. You ready for this? Verse 27. However, 
makes a solid case that he's not required to pay this tax. And then he says this, However, not to give offense to them, go to the sea, cast a hook in, take a fish out that comes up, and when you open its mouth, you will find a shekel. Take that and give it to them for me and for yourself. I think most of us in this situation would use our position, our power, or authority to avoid paying that tax. But Jesus says, look, I'm not required to pay this tax, but let's not cause an unnecessary offense here. Jesus is operating with a different frame of mind. Here's Jesus saying, I am surrendering my right for the sake of a greater cause. And though I am not obligated to do this, I want to do this. Do you know why? Because Jesus knows how to choose his battles. Jesus is not needlessly offensive because Jesus is extremely wise. How is he wise? Well, he already has enemies. He gave Peter a revelation about himself. I am the son of the one who owns the temple. Did other people have that revelation? No. Did everyone hear Jesus explain that, why he was not required to pay the tax? No. They didn't get that explanation, and if they did, most of them would have not believed it. So what is Jesus saying? Why create more controversy than is necessary? Why create offense and give more ammunition to our enemies? Oh, I wish some Christians today would learn this lesson. Jesus is saying, this is not an evil thing per se. This is just a neutral thing. It doesn't matter. And because of that, not to offend them, let's just give them their tax. Oh, that we would have that kind of a heart. That is the glory of Jesus. That we, that's glorious, folks. That's the glory of Jesus that we can behold. I look at that and I say, Lord, I want to be like that. I don't want my existence to orbit around my own rights and my own privileges. Everything revolving around what I believe. I don't want that, Lord. Help me live like you lived. Help me live as though there is a greater cause than my puny little existence. Help me to live not always seeking my rights but for my testimony, and even if I have to give up my right for the sake of my witness, then so be it, Lord. That should be our heart. You see how that works? Now you see something glorious about Jesus, and from, from seeing how awesome it is, you now want to imitate that, to become like him, and that's a Holy Spirit thing. The Holy Spirit doesn't just reveal it to you. The Holy Spirit also inspires you and says, strive for that, and I will empower you to do it. To do as Jesus did. And so I look at Jesus here and I say, oh, I want that for myself. This is glorious behavior. Here's one more example of the glory of Christ, and then I will be done. Jesus, once again, is in one of these back-and-forth things with the spiritual leaders of his day, and at one point, they revert to throwing a personal insult at Jesus. It's just, it's just a flat personal chop. You can always tell when somebody's losing ground in a debate when they run out of good arguments and start hurling personal insults. Here comes the personal insult. John chapter 8, verse 48. The Jews answered him, Are we not right in saying that you are a Samaritan and you have a demon? Man, now you, you understand, do you not, that calling someone a Samaritan in the Jewish world was like calling them the scum of the earth. Then they throw the demon thing in there for good measure, I guess. But notice the glory of Jesus in his response. He completely, first of all, he completely ignores the Samaritan insult, and he only denies the demon. Because him having a demon would definitely negatively impact his ministry. Being a Samaritan... Not so much. Think how you would react if someone insulted you this way. Oh, yeah? I'm a Samaritan, am I? Well, you're a... You could just fill in that blank. Behold the glory of Jesus. Verse 40. Jesus answered, I don't have a demon, but I honor my Father, and you dishonor me. Yet I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. 
The Jews said, Now we know that you have a demon. Abraham died, as did the prophets. Yet you say, if anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham who died? And the prophets died. Who do you make yourself out to be? They just keep coming. Jesus answered, If I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my father who glorifies me, of whom you say he is our God. But you have not known him. I know him. If I were to say that I do not know him, I would be a liar like you. (laughs) But I do know him, and I keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it, and he was glad. So the Jews said to him, You're not even 50 years old, and you've seen Abraham seriously? Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, Here he comes again. Before Abraham was, I am. And they lose their minds. (laughs) Once again, second time today we've seen Jesus do just that. It caused these guys to lose their minds. Verse 59, so they picked up stones to throw at him, and Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. Folks, When you strive to spend time with Jesus, and in doing so, you start to become like him, you start doing the things he did, reacting to difficult situations with calm and grace, you are going to draw fire. You are going to experience slander. You're going to hear accusations, and you're going to hear gossip, and you're going to hear false reports. And when that happens... How do you imitate the glory of Jesus Christ? Well, you see it right here. He knew what to say to defend what he needed to defend, and he knew what to ignore because it had no value. When the Holy Spirit sees you engaging with the glory of the Lord, he assures you, now I'm going to make you like him. I'm going to polish you. I'm going to chisel you, but you can't become unless you first behold. So the question, who is Jesus Christ, is essential for your salvation, and it is inseparable from your sanctification. You keep asking, who is Jesus Christ? And I pray, leaving this place today, folks, that you have a fresh lens through which to read your Bible, and as you read your Bible, you're looking for the glory of Jesus Christ in the epistles, in the Proverbs, in the Old Testament, and in the Gospels. And that as you read, your prayer would be this. Jesus, I want to see your glory. I want it to rub off on me. I want it to become like the very thing that I am beholding. Let's pray. We're going to pray and then we're going to observe the Lord's Supper. I love the sound of them babies. I don't care what anybody else says. Let's pray. Father, we ask you, would you help us arrive there from one degree of glory to another? We thank you that it's not an instantaneous work. It's something that makes a lifetime. As we open our eyes in one season and then next, you open our eyes again to something that we didn't see in the previous one. But Lord, we just pray that there will be this new ambition to ask the question, who is this Jesus? Not just his nature, and his mission concerning the gospel, but concerning his person, his character, his attitude, his example. And so for the person here who has not answered the first type of question concerning their redemption, may they ask it and know the answer to it and be saved today. And for the person who has the confidence that they have the right answer to who is Jesus Christ, may they now be excited to know that there's so much more to know about him. We worship you in this place today, Father, and we give you all the glory and honor in Jesus' name, that name that saves, that name that transforms. Amen. So we're going to do the Lord's Supper, and I don't have, I don't have what I need. Can somebody help me out? <laughs> Thank you. I think it's uh, I think it's very appropriate.
to take the Lord's Supper today in light of the message, in light of our desire to know more of Jesus. One of the things he asks us to do is to remember him. And during his last intimate meeting with his closest companions, Jesus established one of two ordinances that we observe in the church today. We call it the Lord's Supper. We call it communion. And we're going to observe that ordinance together this morning. So if you don't have one of these, like me, you can make your way and get one. They're all around the room here. Um, and as we observe the Lord's Supper together, I want to encourage you to consider what Jesus asked of his disciples that night as they shared their meal together. He asked them simply to remember him. I think the implication was not just remember him, their friend and their companion, but to remember his teachings, to remember his examples when he displayed the glory of himself to them in the way he dealt with people, and most importantly, the sacrifice he was about to make on their behalf and on our behalf. You see, when we remember Jesus, one overarching theme we see in his teaching, his example, and his sacrifice for us on the cross is the incredible attitude of selflessness in his entire life, his entire ministry on the earth revealed to us. Jesus' entire life and ministry and even his death was in service to others. That Christ-like selfishness is the one thing that I continue to come face-to-face -face with in my own life. It's been a theme that the Lord has brought to the forefront of my attention over and over again. I cannot escape it. I find myself wondering what kind of difference I could make in my little sphere of influence if I took seriously Jesus' example of putting others ahead of myself on a regular basis. On a consistent basis. If I'm honest, I'd have to admit it's not a very popular notion to put others ahead of ourselves. All too often, the slightest bit of discomfort makes me cranky. The Apostle Paul was dealing with the lack of selflessness in this Corinthian church. When they gathered together for the Lord's Supper, apparently there was a lot of pushing and shoving and disregard for others taking place, such that Paul was compelled to, to well offer a word of correction. And he did so by reminding them of Jesus' words and actions at that last Passover meal. So as we take the Lord's Supper this morning, I want to encourage you to really reflect on Jesus' perfect sacrifice. His life taught us selflessness. Scripture tells us his death atoned for our sins and his blood rescues us from death and saves us from slavery. That is a gift I will take all day long. Amen. And so Paul says, for I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself on the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus Christ took some bread and he gave thanks to God for it. And then he broke it in pieces and he said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this to remember me as often as you drink it. Father, we thank you this morning. Jesus, we thank you this morning for the sacrifice you made on our behalf so many years ago, but that still lives on today, a living sacrifice. Father, thank you that you have reminded us to remember you, to think about you, and to continue to ask the question, who is this Jesus Christ? We ask it in his strong name. Amen.